When you know it's a WWE Big Four pay-per-view weekend, it's not just the pay-per-view on Sunday night itself, it's you know you're getting an NXT TakeOver show. And last night, we got NXT TakeOver Philadelphia, and if you already weren't excited for that, the very first thing you saw as the show went live was Paul Heyman's video hype package talking about the past was the past, and these guys are the future. Marcus Small here, and I gotta tell you, NXT TakeOver Philadelphia was awesome, incredible, a spectacular extravaganza of professional wrestling. Every match delivered, Aleister Black, Adam Cole, incredible, Cien Almas, Johnny Gargano, possible match of the year candidate, no matter what that other idiot says, this was another great NXT TakeOver show because they never have a bad NXT TakeOver show. And in fact, if this show was in Japan, it might be the motherfucking wrestling show of the year. Until the next time New Japan does a bitch show. And here's the question for you, Marcus, and a lot of other people out there. If every single NXT TakeOver show is so great and so awesome, then doesn't that become the minimum standard? And as a result, doesn't that mean technically that no show is great? Or awesome, how do you differentiate if you blow every one of them full of smoke? Crap, you're stupid. You're just a hater. And that's why nobody likes you. Nobody cares what you have to say. No, it's the fanboy and crap like that, Marcus. It makes it hard sometimes to get into this stuff. Because when I see people and hear people say these type of things like you are, it just gets freaking annoying. But anyways, on to the show at hand. The good thing about NXT TakeOver shows is there are maybe five to six matches on the card total, maybe two to two and a half hours, that's it. And it's a bit of a gift, so you can watch an important major show and spend less than three hours doing so. The bad thing is that goes in lockstep with the next night, the WWE is giving you a four-plus-hour main pay-per-view. But in and of itself, on the Saturday night, you're looking for something to do. You can get in and get out in a couple of hours. Not a bad deal. And I will say one thing, I was disappointed that not one single promo segment tied into the fact that this was Philadelphia, the Eagles are in the Super Bowl, you didn't have Mojo Raleigh or Elias or anybody come out there and get that cheap heat promo, being pro-Patriots and bashing the Eagles. Imagine Mojo Raleigh walking out there in a Gronkowski jersey. Imagine Elias singing a song about the Patriots and the Eagles. It just it was a missed opportunity. You don't always have to have so many matches on your damn cards, and this would have been a way to break up some of the monotony of the matches and really add another element to that show, really get that crowd pumped up early on in the night. I, and that said, I've got three complaints for that live crowd in Philly. Number one, the This Is Awesome chants are still stupid, especially when they happen before the match has even begun. Number two, the NXT chants are even dumber, just like they were in the 90s when people chanted ECW. If you like what's going on in the ring, how about you chant for the wrestlers, not the brand, you idiots! Number three, most specifically and most importantly, if you like the heels, please boo them! Anyways, on to the actual show. You kick off which it, what it seems like the match that people cared the least about, the NXT Tag Team Championship match between the Authors of Pain and the Undisputed Era. I look at the Authors of Pain with Precious Paul Ellering, and they look like a promising team. They look big dudes that have some athleticism to them. It feels like they have some main roster potential. On the flip side, the Undisputed Era, which is kind of a joke name in and of itself, I look at Fish, I look at O'Reilly, and I'm sorry, they look like ham and eggers, they look like jabronis, they look like dudes that deserve nothing more than to be jobbers on 205 Live. Oh, imagine that, let me guess, because they're not six foot four, 300 pound cock fists. You don't like them, right? No, and in part it's because they look like me. If I was in a WWE or NXT ring, would you take it seriously? Would you take me seriously? Would you view me as a big-time future main event type of star? Of course not. Nobody does take you seriously, and more importantly, nobody should. Exactly my point. In terms of the dynamics of this match, you've got monsters versus monster killers. 
And you know what? I understand that both got teams have to be able to do their own things to try and get themselves over within the match, what have you. But we shouldn't be sending the monsters to the mat so quickly. Like within two minutes, we're already working over one of the guy's legs, one of the guy's knees. The monsters need to be monsters a little bit first, so that way, if and when the monster killers start to get the upper hand, when they start to do their thing, they start to work over said monster, it makes more sense and it has a bigger impact. And these are one of the small things I feel like so often are missed in professional wrestling today. Let the monster be monster first. Then you can start to knock them down a couple of pegs. That said, it was an adequate opener, and honestly, the right team won in the right way. Match number two, Cassius Ono versus the Velveteen Dream. <laughs> and I look at Cassius Ono, though, and I ask myself, who in the hell is he supposed to be? What is he supposed to be about? And why the hell should I care about him? Like, I look at him and looking at his physical stature and the weight and the belly that he has, it feels like we're missing a real opportunity in making him some type of cowboy type of character, some type of barroom brawler type of character, somebody like a JBL, somebody like the cowboy James Storm. Did somebody say the cowboy James Storm? Yes, I did, Dick, but he wasn't there tonight. Oh, don't worry. He'll be there soon enough. Because I feel like they're missing an opportunity with Cassius Ono. I do. Uh, because he should be some type of character. And to me, frankly, he really isn't. Now, on the flip side, the Velveteen Dream is clearly a character. Now, I've talked about before how I'm not particularly a fan of this shtick. I'm tired of the WWE always presenting black male wrestlers in certain types of ways. Whether they have to be thugs or some type of criminal. Or they have to be dancing and singing and rapping and doing all this other stuff, or in this particular case, acting all types of suspect. Now, maybe that's what Vince and Hunter like in their black men, I don't know. But there are plenty of wrestling fans that don't want to see every black wrestler being portrayed like this. However, with that said, if you are going to go down this path, or you're going to go down this kind of androgynous, making people feel uncomfortable type of path, then you need to go balls deep. You need to go all the way. You do need to go down that gold dust type of path. It feels like they kind of half-ass it. And while I like the touch of the girl there at ringside and the shirtless dude ringside, like it adds a little bit more to the Velveteen Dream, if you're going to go there, you need to go there. And don't give me that crap that this isn't the 90s anymore. There is plenty of homophobia out there. And yes, homophobia makes people uncomfortable. You need to go after that. You need to embrace that. You need to seize upon that. Because it feels like they're just kind of playing around with it a little bit. A little bit of fondling, a little bit of foreplay. And they're not diving, pardon the pun, balls deep into it. And they should be. Because it would take that character to an entirely different level. Especially when it ends up on the main roster. Now ultimately the match was kind of rough. But I'm okay with that. Not every match needs to be crisp or perfect. It did what it needed to do, especially from the very beginning. You're starting off right away where Velveteen Dream had promised that he was going to knock out KO within the first 30 seconds, and the crowd is immediately counting down the 30 seconds. These guys did what they were supposed to do. Velveteen Dream won, but it was like once he won, it felt like there would have been a whole different element here if he would have kissed KO on the forehead or on the cheek. And that could just be me, and I could be nuts, and I know I am, but I also know I'm right. NXT Women's Championship, Shayna Baszler versus Ember Moon. I will give the ladies credit. They tried to actually work the match instead of just doing spots. They actually tried to tell a story, specifically Shayna working the arm, working the submission angle, and Ember Moon selling the hell out of that arm pretty consistently throughout the match. I appreciate that type of attention to detail. But no matter what, as I give credit for that, on the flip side, I just never got into this match. I just was not feeling it. I was not jiving or vibing with it. Um, I don't know if, if it's because I didn't really care about the characters or maybe I felt that Shayna wasn't quite ready for the spot. I don't really know. But I just, no matter what I did, even though I appreciated what they tried to do, sometimes it just doesn't work. Even when you do some of the good fundamental things, sometimes it just doesn't work. And in particular, it felt like the timing of Shayna Baszler's uh, post-match attack on Ember Moon was a little bit off. Like Ember pins her, and then Shayna sits there for a minute or two. It feels like, in the way that she was pinned, she should have immediately been attacking Ember Moon from like the split second as soon as the realization hit that she lost. If that's the way you were going to go. But more so, I felt like the finish was wrong for this match. And I look at this card, 
Just because you can have every finish be clear and decisive doesn't mean it should or that you need to. And in this particular case, this felt like the match on the card where you could have had some wishy-washy count-out disqualification type of finish, especially specifically if Baszler would have knocked Ember Moon out outside of the ring and would have won via count-out. Now you have a reason for a return match. And you're going to say, well, the way that she attacked her afterwards you have a reason for a return match, but I feel like you would have had a much better reason for a return match if you would have had Baszler get the count-out victory and then proceed to immediately attack Ember Moon and damage her arm some more. It's just, to me, it felt like they could have done more with this match and they just kind of played it safe and gave Ember Moon the victory. And during the show, they showed you some of the newest additions to the Performance Center crew, Ricochet, Yeehaw, War Machine, and then EC. Three is in the house, back where he was before, and we're going to pretend like he wasn't Derek Bateman. EC3, you can run to NXT, but you can't hide. The Cowboy's coming, and when he does, vengeance will be his, justice will be mine. Woo! Ride the dick stone, baby. For my money, the match of the night was Aleister Black, Adam Cole, this street fight. This, to me, was the true match of the night. This was the match heading in that I thought had the most potential to be the best of the night for me. And it was. I'm officially a fan of Aleister Black. I feel like he's somebody that's a little bit different. I feel like he's somebody who translates relatively well to the main roster as long as you keep Vince as far away from him as you possibly can. I, I feel like Aleister Black has a decent future. Now, on the flip side, I look at Adam Cole, and I think he's okay. Um, I think he's a decent talent. He's got a, a good look. He's not a huge guy. But I will say, there are a lot of guys like him already on the main roster. So I think he could make it. I'm just more bullish on Aleister Black's future, and I'm a bigger fan of him and his work right now. Excuse me, there is only one Adam Cole. Baby. Yes, Marcus, except for all the other guys on the Raw and SmackDown rosters with similar sizes and similar looks, there's only one Adam Cole. Baby. But nonetheless, on to more serious things. The action in this match was brutal, but it, it was interesting to me and exciting to me that these guys didn't just bump the hell of the way around through an Extreme Rules type of match. Like, the anti-Young Bucks. Like, these guys actually bothered to try to set up the big shit they were doing. They were actually trying to have arcs within the story of what they were trying to tell in the match. Even, like, early on when they both had the kendo sticks and Aleister Black threw his kendo stick to the side. And Adam Cole, look, kind of gave you that laugh like, ha 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 ha, it's a cute puppy. You stupid idiot, why would you do that? It's those type of things that happen in a match that really hook me, that get me invested, that get me excited. Even the run-ins in this case made a world of sense from story standpoint. You have a street fight, you have an Extreme Rules type of match. Why wouldn't the other two members of Undisputed Era run in? As a result then, why would Insanity, who has had issues with these guys, why wouldn't they run in as well? Like, to me, so much about this match was executed so well. And I would be absolutely stunned if this doesn't end up on my 10 best list at the end of 2018. War Alistair Black! Your main event of the night, Johnny Gargano versus Andrade Cien Almas for the NXT Championship. Like I said, to me, the real main event of this show was going to be Alistair Black and Adam Cole. It was going to be really, really hard for these two guys in the actual main event for the NXT title to match it or top it. That said, I look at Cien Almas. And I see a guy that has grown tremendously over the past six to nine months in my mind as a performer, as a talent. Like I looked at him previously and I, I didn't see it. I didn't see why they would be big on him. I didn't see why he had much of a future. But also bearing in mind sometimes that we're talking about NXT. This is about development. This is about trying to transitioning him and teaching him into a WWE way. I look at this dude now, it's night and day. And when you throw Selena Vega in the mix, it just brings an entirely new element to him, not just erections. And speaking of that, if I had Selena Vega as my manager, I would have a really hard time not having one constant state of erection. It would be really awkward to ever show me uh, below the waist on television. I'm just saying. And then on the flip side, Johnny Gargano. He 
kind of has a bit of a Daniel Bryan appeal to him. I won't quite go and say he has that same level of appeal, that same ability to connect. But clearly there's something there with that type of audience. He feels like a natural, organic type of babyface. He feels like almost one of these unanimous type of baby faces that is really rare to get in today's WWE landscape. Um, and I know that there's going to be a vast consensus on this match, and I saw it in other people's videos and saw it on social media. Great, incredible, what a story they told, match of the year candidate, better than sex. The truth is, I wasn't buying the story that this match was trying to sell. Because the video package hyping up this match between Gargano and Almas was talking about how Gargano had been beaten down, he had lost himself, he was no longer Johnny Wrestling, and for a while he doubted himself, but then he's starting to get it back and he's starting to believe in himself, but he doesn't really fully. And you're selling it like Almas is willing to take this chance against Gargano because he doesn't feel Gargano is in his league like they feel like he's not quite ready for prime time and then as I watch this match it's so much of a 50-50 competitive back and forth swing type of balanced match and it just felt like it was the wrong type of match for what you were trying to do or at least it felt like the story you were trying to tell or your shit who knows maybe you weren't trying to tell a story at all like I saw several people online several notable people on Twitter talking about the great story that this match told and to be honest from my perspective based off of the limited exposure I had I said what in the hell were they talking about this match did not tell a great story it did not tell the story that it was supposed to tell in fact I thought it was very substandard to pour in that sense sure you got a lot of big impact moves and you got a lot of great spots but the hope spots with Gargano that would get mixed in they don't mean nearly as much if they're not really hope spots because there's been three four five minutes where he's been controlling the action hope spots are supposed to be hope spots where you occasionally get that glimmer of hope and then you get back crashed down to reality I didn't feel like I was watching underdog versus the champion here I did not. And if that was the story they were trying to go for in this match, they failed and in my opinion failed miserably. I know I saw a lot of people talking about this was not only match of the night, but a match of the year candidate. To me, Black and Cole was better in a variety of different ways on so many different levels. So you can have this NXT Championship match, that's fine. Give me Aleister Black and Adam Cole all day long. Now, with that said, I did appreciate how they had Candice LeRae come out at one point and stand up for her husband. That was a highlight of the match. Like, that was the one thing to me that really, truly made a lot of sense. Like, Selena Vega was great here. When they did the Candice LeRae run-in, that was awesome. Um, but the match, to me, kind of fell flat. Almost won, and it felt like it was not convincing enough for the type of presentation or packaging you were trying to do here. And then afterwards, initially I didn't get it, but I had Chase Oliver and a couple other people explain it to me on Twitter why T Tommaso Ciampa came up and hit Gargano be from behind with the crutch. Cool, whatever. Feels like it would have had more impact still personally if he would have cost him the match, not attacked him afterwards. But I understand maybe why they didn't. Okay match. I will say that. A lot of high impact shit. But I'm sorry, I need a little bit more than high-impact shit and a bunch of spots to say that a match was great. Overall, NXT TakeOver Philadelphia, it took up, what, two and a half hours or so. I thought it was a solid show. I'm not going to sit there and drool over this thing because it's an NXT TakeOver show and be foolish enough to tell you that every one of them is great and awesome because they're not. Some are better than others. I thought this was a good show. I did not think this was a great show. And I've talked about throughout this video some of the things that I felt like could have been done better to make it a greater show in my eyes. Now, of course, there will be vast disagreement with me from the NXT nut huggers, and that's fine. I really don't care. But it's just one of those things where I look at this and I say, if this is the future of the presentation of the WWE, I don't get as giggly tits about the future as many of you do. And that's why it's important to remember that I am the Schleg Daddy, and this is OTRS Central, where it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Let me know what you thought about this show in the comments below, and make sure you check back for the 2018 Royal Rumble Review. Yeehaw!